Good morning, everyone. My name is Kareem Solomon, and today I'm going to talk about volume assessment pre, during, and post transplant, stressing on some remarks I've been seeing during the past few years. Sa'at ehna el mushkila. What's that? It's an Arabic phrase meaning sometimes we are the problem. Stay tuned. So, this is Dr. Zemmelweis. He's a Hungarian physician who moved to Vienna and worked there as an OBGYN doctor in two clinics. At some point, there was an endemic called child birth fever. Infants were born and die within 48 hours. No one was able to figure out what's going on. Physician kept doing autopsies in the middle of the night, trying to figure out what's going on, and delivering babies in the morning, and the cycle goes on and on and on. They do autopsies in the middle of the night, and babies die in the morning. All physicians there drifted their attention to invent treatment rather than finding the cause of the problem. Dr. Zemmelweis came one day and claimed that physicians should wash their hands appropriately to end this endemic, and no one listened to him. They called him stupid, they called him idiot, and at the end they fired him from the hospital or from the clinic. He went back to Vienna and noticed the same thing. He claimed the same thing, and no one believed him till he died from sepsis at the age of 47, probably from the same cause. At that time, a very famous physician, at that time, he adopted Dr. Zemmelweis' idea and theory and started implementing hand washing. And guess what? The endemic vanished. They named the university in Hungary and after his name, Dr. Zemmelweis Reflex. What's the moral of this story? Sometimes we are the problem. Sometimes we drift our attention to some things and totally ignore other things. As I said, our lecture will focus on volume assessment pre, during, and post transplant. And here are the three stages. Talking about the pre side, how many meetings would, did we go through discussing who should get a left heart cath? Hundreds? We even created a smart phrase who should get a left heart cath? Makes sense, right? Our cardiovascular mortality has been increasing and we drifted our attention to pre-transplant workup. Who should get a left heart cath? I think hundreds of meetings, hundreds of hours, right? Which is totally fine. What if I told you that most guidelines, including Kidigo, I always say Kidigo when there is a court, what does Kidigo say, right? Kidigo guidelines. Uh, they say that routine prophylactic revascularization or angiography is not recommended in patients with severe coronary artery disease who are asymptomatic with good functional capacity and a negative stress test. They even don't recommend a stress test in patients with a mild coronary artery disease. They also say there is no evidence that angiography is required in asymptomatic coronary artery disease patients with a negative stress test. And this is because transplant is a moderate risk operation and no major cardiac complications is anticipated or should be anticipated. Surprise, right? <laughs> Talking about some of the left heart cath complications, uh, this is a patient who developed cholesterol embolism in his toes after a left heart cath. Um, and this is another patient who was considered ESRD and stage renal disease on dialysis for six months and he was making about one liter of urine daily. You decided to do a left heart cath for him, and his residu residual kidney functions are gone. So you killed his remaining urine output. He became anuric. So from the theoretical contrast-induced nephropathy. That urine output was helping him in between the sessions to drink more fluids. However, sometimes we are the problem. So let's highlight or focus on some other things now on post-transplant care. What I mean by post-transplant care here is fluid management mainly. So we'll focus only on fluid management here. Again, reiterating the fact the way we see the problem is the problem. Before we go deep into the subject, this is a diagram showing the US healthcare expenditure per capita 
It was $2.3 trillion in 2017 and $3.1 trillion in 2020. So we have the highest healthcare expenditure compared to any other country. And despite that, we still have fatal, missed, potentially preventable errors. Let me give you an example of this missed or type 2 error. This is a 54-year-old male status post-liver transplant eight days ago. He has increasing static tremors, abdomen is not rigid, and urine output started to drop to 20 cc per hour. Serum creatinine went up from 1.2 to 2.1 to 2.6 and 3.1. FK level is 8.2, and uh, it was 4 a few days ago. His serum albumin is 1.5, and UA is unremarkable. Transplant nephrology was consulted for kidney biopsy or possibly dialysis. So what's the most likely cause of his kidney injury? So it's probably not GN because the UA is bland or unremarkable and likely also not intra-abdominal hypertension because the abdomen is not rigid. So what's left? FK toxicity. Hey, but the FK level is therapeutic. It's 8.2. How? If you don't know the pharmacodynamics of FK, you will mishear the diagnosis. And let me tell you why. FK is carried mostly on RBCs, about 90 to 95%. That's why it's called tacrolimus whole blood, right? 3 to 4% is carried on protein and albumin, and 1 to 2% is the free portion. So toxicity stems from the free and carried portion. So the free one, it's not carried on the red blood cells, it's not carried on the protein or albumin. So this 8.2% that you see here, it's a surrogate marker of the free portion that causes actually the toxicity. So if you have a low albumin, the free portion is high. And this high part, that causes the toxicity. Apart from the neurotoxicity we saw, the tremors, this is vasoconstriction or afferent vasoconstriction of the kidneys, decreases blood supply to the kidney, pre-renal element, a key kidney injury, elevation of creatinine and here you're not you don't know what's going on i mean fk is therapeutic it's 8.2 however the free portion is very high again if we don't know this small info we will fall into misdiagnosis we're not aware of the problem so we either dialyze the patient or pursue a kidney biopsy and that's exactly what the u.s healthcare system is trying to avoid misdiagnosis and avoiding expensive workup that's unnecessary. So understand volume status. This is a 54 year old male status post liver transplant eight days ago. Blood pressure is 99 over 70 and the CVP is six. He has ascites, pleurifusion and bilateral lower extremity edema. What's the patient's volume? So what's the patient's volume status? Is he hypervolemic, hypovolemic? dehydrated or intravascular volume depleted but hypervolemic so answer is c so his intravascular volume depleted because the blood pressure is margin low and the cvp is, is on the lower side however he's hypervolemic he has lots of fluids inside him the ascites the pleurifusion so you cannot say here he's hypovolemic despite that the blood pressure is low and you cannot say dehydrated because dehydrated is a water issue more then total volume issue. Got it? Another example to understand volume status. This is a 67-year-old female patient on PD for four years, called in for a deceased donor kidney transplant. On arrival, patient reports reports her dry weight to, see, to, be, to be 78 kgs. She has mild dyspnea on exertion. Blood pressure is 154 over 92, and she's on two blood pressure medications. She does not have any lower extremity edema, chest is clear, and the BNP, beta nitritic peptide, is 110, or maybe 590, whatever. What's the volume status of this patient? Is she hypervolemic or hypovolemic? By exam, apart from blood pressure, there is no edema and chest is clear. Some people can say she's euvolemic. So the most common cause, most common cause of high blood pressure in PD patients is volume overload. That's because 
your blood vessel can accommodate up to five liters inside before manifesting with edema or pleural effusion. So this patient is probably hypervolemic and some people call it occult hypervolemia. So blood pressure is high, they're in two blood pressure medications. If you remove more fluids or give them Lasix if they're still making urine, um, they might reach euvolemia, but at this point, probably she's hypervolemic. And just a quick note regarding the beta natriuretic peptide, usually less than 100 excludes congestive heart failure. More than 500 is usually specific for heart failure. Between 100 and 500 is sensitive, suggestive of heart failure, congestive heart failure, but uh, not confirmatory. Um, and I'll come to this later. Here, I want you to understand the dry weight. So the dry weight is often inaccurate. It's not true. It's really, really very subjective according to who's the nephrologist who decides what's the dry weight or determines the dry weight. It's very challenging. And it's very complicated. So let me give you a story. Um, a 25 year old male in stage renal disease, secondary FSGS, he comes in with a blood pressure of 180 over 100 on two blood pressure medications. So the nephrologist starts to pull some fluids uh, in order to reach his dry weight. So he pulls fluid, pulls fluid one day until the patient feels cramping. So he said, okay, stop pulling fluids now. This is your dry weight. He ended up with a blood pressure of 160 on two blood pressure medication. Okay, what's your dry weight? 70 kgs. Another nephrologist comes and then says, oh, this patient has a high blood pressure of 160. He's still on two blood pressure medication. Yeah, but this patient cramped last, last session. No problem. Just remove more fluids. Let him cramp more. Every session, you start challenging her dry weight, removing extra fluid, removing extra fluid every time until he cramps. And you can do this six, seven times. Believe it or not, you can remove like six, seven kgs more out of him, end up with only one blood pressure medication, and his blood pressure is like 130 over 80. Who decided what's the dry weight? It's either the nurse there or the nephrologist. They determined, the first one determined the blood pressure, that the dry weight is 70 kgs on two blood pressure medication and his blood pressure is 170. Another nephrologist determined that the blood, that his dry weight is um, 64 or something, six or seven kgs less with a blood pressure of 120 or 130 over 80 on only one blood pressure medication. See the difference? And in this spectrum, you can find different opinions and and different uh, dry weights and where it lands that's why i don't trust dry weights coming from the patient or from the center i've seen that many times you can challenge that dry weight like removing every time they cramp every time they cramp and you squeeze more every time they cramp and you squeeze more until you reach the actual dry weight so in pre-transplant workup or for pre-transplant coordinators what worries you so there are different scenarios, bunch of scenarios. The first scenario is say blood pressure drop on hemodialysis. Sometimes people freak out from this. So if you have a young age, like a 20, 25 year old, he was a fresh start uh, on dialysis and he's on two, three hypertensive, antihypertensive medications and their blood pressure drop on dialysis. Are you concerned with that scenario? I'm not. He's young. He just started dialysis. Probably he's hypervolemic on blood pressure medication and you pull fluids, I mean, he will drop. And this drop in blood pressure is not something to be concerned of. Another patient with high blood pressure before HD on antihypertensive medicine, and he drops on dialysis. Are you concerned? Again, I'm not. Low blood pressure before HD, he's on metadrine, diabetic for a long time and cardiac. Yeah, that might concern me a, a little bit. The last scenario, low, low blood pressure before HD, and he's tachycardic, and the blood pressure drops even more on HD. What's that? That's pericardial effusion. That's very important. And sometimes if it's tamponading, this is an emergency. They have fluid around the heart, so that causes tachycardia. When you remove fluid, you collapse the cha chambers of the heart, and that's very important, and some people don't recognize that. So the patient is like, hypervolemic on the exam, they have fluid inside the heart, you try pull fluids, and the patient might collapse. 
So this is a very important clinical point. So blood pressure elevation on HD. Several causes. One of them is renin driven. And what's renin? Renin is a protein or protease secreted by the kidney. Uh, bottom line, when the blood pressure drops, patient developed hypovolemia. Uh, when you remove some extra fluid, the renin will go up in order to vasoconstrict the vessels in order to maintain this blood pressure. And while it does that, the blood pressure might go up, elevate, and it causes high blood pressure, hypertension. Also, when you use high sodium on the machine, when you use high sodium in the machine and the patient does not have a, a higher sodium compared to the machine, uh, the blood pressure will go up. One more thing, cold dialysate. If you contact yourself with cold water, um, same theory, the blood vessels will vasoconstrict, elevate your blood pressure. So many, many causes, but these are one of those causes. So some people freak out from the fact if a patient pulls a lot of fluids during HD sessions. Actually, that's not necessarily true. So if a young patient pulls three to four liters, for example, in between um, during the session, um, and his young blood pressure does not drop and he's anuric, is that concerning? I'm not very concerned about this. For example, if you use a high sodium bath, um, that's your, your problem, your fault, you're creating iatrogenic thirst, the patient will come out of the dialysis and will drink like a horse. So when you, you, you have to pull a lot of fluids from, from him, again, he does not have any residual kidney functions. He's not peeing at all. Some people pee like a liter every day. So they already pee like two liters and then you remove two liters. That's a total of four liters in between sessions that he gets rid of. If he's totally anuric, you have to pull all those four liters during the session. So uh, that's another thing to be considered. So not all scenarios that too much ultrafiltration or too much fluids is really concerning. And about non-compliance, that's also a question mark. Two questions here. Why do we left heart cath a long-standing diabetic? This is the first question. Well, diabetes is the most common cause of cardiovascular disease and antigenial disease. Also, cardiovascular disease is one of the most common causes of this in end-stage kidney disease. If someone is diabetic more than 20 years on insulin and uncontrolled, probably they have lots of microvascular complications and microvascular complications affecting the coronary, so sometimes they're occluded. Not talking about all the reactive oxygen species, hypertriglyceridemia, all the diabetic complications. So it's one of the most common causes of cardiovascular disease. That's why we sometimes do the prophylactic, although it's against Kidigo guidelines, but we do prophylactic just to make sure that the patient does not have something to be corrected. So the second question is, can you transplant a high-risk cardiac patient? So here where we say nephrology kicks in, right? So this is an email um, I sent out. Probably some of you got it before. So a patient was a long-standing diabetic, and some people said that there is no risk, uh, particularly cardiologist, because the patient is asymptomatic. One very important thing is diabetics are usually asymptomatic in terms of cardiac wise because they have diabetic neuropathy. So they develop something called painless or silent myocardial infarction, and they can pass into arrest without noticing any problems at all. And they don't have the typical chest pain of uh, angina. So uh, my recommendation at that time uh, if we want to proceed with a high-risk cardiac patient, avoid excessive fluids. Um, you have to do it really, really under strict CVP guidance. Uh, usually, we prefer uh, CVP to be like 12 uh, at the time of anastomosis. You do CC by CC replacement for 24 to 36 hours, depending on the urine output and creatinine trend, and then drop to 75%. Be very cautious with fluid overload in these patients. So with the 75%, you include also the PO, keep blood pressure around 120 over 140 to 140 over 70 over 90. And forget, please, about this permissive hypertension, letting the patient be discharged at 150, 160. Uh, very small boluses you can give if the blood pressure is less than 110 over 70, not when the urine output drops. Keep the hemoglobin around 8, and you can give Lasix PRN depending on the clinical assessment and blood pressure. So if the blood pressure is high and the patient started to develop a little bit of oliguria, you can push with Lasix. 
can get an echo, heart, continue monitoring the blood pressure, and maybe a BNP before surgery. These are just some thoughts. By the way, uh, you don't trend BNP inside the hospital. Moving on to the OR, in kidney transplant patient. During the kidney transplant operation, what volume status do you prefer? You want them eubolemic with a CVP 8 to 10, slightly hypervolemic with a CVP 12 to 15, or slightly hypovolemic with a CVP 6 to 8. So usually you prefer them slightly hypervolemic with a CVP 12 to 15 in order to get be, be sure that the kidney has a lot of blood supply at the time of anastomosis. So flush the kidney well. And you don't want to risk any more further hypotension or decreased blood supply to the kidney. So this is maybe the only situation where you really like that the kidney has much fluids and the patient is a little bit on the higher side. Problem is here when the patient comes originally with a high CVP, like 18 or 19, and not manifested by lower extremity edema or pleural effusion or pulmonary edema. This is the tricky part where you look at blood pressure and some other things to determine hypervolemia. And I'm wondering here, do we measure central venous pressure or CVP here? No, right? We don't measure it. I prefer, honestly, I personally prefer measuring it. Some centers do, some centers don't. But I think it's one of the very objective criteria of knowing the volume status of the patient, especially during anastomosis and right after that. Some pitfalls post-transplant. This is a 54-year-old male status post-kidney transplant two days ago. His blood pressure is 160 over 90. Weight is up 4 kgs. He received twice LASIK, 600 milligrams, uh, eight hours apart, one maybe at 7 or 8 a.m. and the other one at 3 or 4 p.m. Blood pressure dropped a little bit to 150 over 85, and uh, at 11 p.m., his urine output track started to drop to 40 cc per hour, and he's net positive 3 liters. Uh, you check the Foley catheter, and it's not obstructed. Uh, so the RN page, the resident, what would you do? In that particular patient, uh, the patient got fluid bolus because the urine output dropped with a high blood pressure, so they thought that might be... Uh, volume loss or they don't have enough fluids inside them so they give the, they give the patient the fluid bolus and guess what gnn will run after us in the rta meeting right the quality team who's gnn right so we don't want to do that right so correct answer is give lasix anyone knows why the uh, urine output dropped because Lasix works only six hours. So if you give it in the morning, it will last six hours. And then give another dose, it will last again six hours. The patient is still volume up, still weight is up, still blood pressure is high. After six hours, it will wear off and then the urine up will start to drop. So either leave them alone or give them another dose of Lasix. There is no problem with that. As long as the blood pressure is good and maintained, don't worry about Lasix at all. Another uh, scenario, pitfalls post-transplant. A 76-year-old male with coronary artery disease status post-kidney transplant eight days ago. He developed severe diarrhea, blood pressure dropped to 110 over 60. He's alert, oriented, weight down, weight is down 2 kgs, and hemoglobin is 7.1 gram per deciliter. What should you avoid? Rapid IV fluid boluses. What if you give them 2 liter of normal saline and 1 unit of packed RBCs? What's the expectation? So he's 76, he has a coronary artery disease. However, blood pressure is maintained. I mean, it dropped a little bit, but maintained. He's alert oriented, not in a hypovolemic shock. I mean, weight is down a little bit. So if you give boluses, what will happen? GNN will run after us in the RCA meeting and the patient will end up with the ICU, either with an MI or with an AFib with RBR, right? So we don't wanna do that. Another uh, scenario, pitfalls pre-transplant. A 46-year-old male uh, patient status post-deceased donor kidney transplant post-operative day two. He's positive four liters since admission, positive four kgs. Blood pressure is 160 over 95 and then started to develop oliguria. So this is a reader scenario. Uh, the patient received 500 cc IV normal saline. Um, another 500 cc, he developed 
atrial stretch from intravascular volume overload, change in, in the atrium, patients run in, patient run into AFib with RVR. Because he's young, if he's old, he'll develop probably an MI. So what happened next? The patient um, cardiology was consulted and the patient was started on Deltiazem. So when you start the patient on Deltiazem, antihypertensive medicine to, to do the rate control, patient will develop hypotension and he's originally volume overloaded. So you're unable to ultrafiltrate him. Uh, potential FK toxicity because Deltiazem is like a cytochrome P450 inhibitor. So FK goes up. And then the patient might develop delay, delay graph function from the hypotension and from the volume overload. Volume overload is like a cardiorenal syndrome picture and hypovolemia decrease uh, blood supply to the kidney. Sometimes you got to realize you are the problem. Just remember the $3.1 trillion spent on healthcare expenditure. And this is type of the missed, two, uh, missed diagnosis or the type 2 error. So wondering, some random boluses will cost us hundreds of meetings, RCA, root cause analysis meetings, and protocol changes. Let's do a left heart cath. When should we do a left heart cath? Two years post-cabbage, three years post-cabbage, five years post-cabbage, diabetic more than 20 years. And we're drifting our attention into one part and totally ignoring, ignoring another major, major part. Some random boluses may cost us hundreds of extra left heart cath hundreds and thousands of dollars in ICU, higher mortality because you're overloading them and higher DGF rate from the uh, congestion in the renal vein congestion, like the cardiorenal syndrome picture. So uh, briefly, what's beta natriuretic peptide or BNP? BNP is a potential marker for volume overload and it's often nonspecific. So very briefly and very broadly, when the volume goes up, you give more fluids. The myocardium of the heart gets stretched. BNP and ANP goes up. They decrease the aldosterone, the antidiuretic hormone, and the renin, promote the kidney to lose more fluids, more naturesis, more sodium, and causes more vasodilatation, so the blood pressure goes down. So we use this as a, car as a surrogate marker when the BNP goes up. That means that the heart is stretched and under um, uh, stress, stress, and that's why um, we use it like a surrogate marker for hypovolemia. So worth mentioning, don't be tricked by BNP. As we mentioned at the beginning, BNP less than 100 usually rules out heart failure. And BNP more than 500 is usually specific for heart failure. However, there are some pitfalls. BNP might increase in old age, in high blood pressure patients, in a female with end-stage kidney disease. So these four factors might falsely increase the BNP. There are some other factors that might decrease the BNP falsely. If someone is obese or anti or on antihypertensive medicine, uh, specifically those which improve the cardiac remodeling or decrease uh, cardiac affection on the long run. So pearls and fluid replacement. A 54-year-old male status post-kidney transplant post-op day zero uh, blood pressure is 140 over 95, and he's getting CC by CC fluid replacement. What is the best IV fluid replacement you would give? LR, half normal salin, plus or minus um, one amp of bicarb, normal salin, or D5W. What's the best fluid replacement you would give? LR, I think we do LR here, right? LR. So... The best fluid replacement is half normal saline, plus or minus bicarb. So what happens if we give LR or normal saline or replace the, or replace the urine output with normal saline or LR? So let's sum it up. This is from the handbook of kidney transplantation. At time of anastomosis, as we said, you prefer that the patient is one kg above their dry weight. And that's supposedly that you know their dry weight, their actual dry weight. And then you replace usually uh, the urine sodium concentration just after post-operative period in a DGF or an ATN kidney. At the beginning is usually 60 to 80 milli equivalents per liter. So you have to replace the same amount, 60 to 80 milli equivalents per liter, um, in order to not overload the patient. Can you imagine if you give them um, a solution with 130 or 135 or 154 um, sodium, 
you give them the double amount of sodium, you develop more hypertension, high blood pressure, and you guess what? Volume overload them because water follows sodium, right? When necessary, you give potassium, bar carb, or calcium replacement. Some people do the insensible loss. I don't uh, prefer it because it's more, um, you drive them more into a hypervolemia. They give 30 ml per hour, but um, per experience of what I've seen, they, they usually, you drive the patient more into hypervolemia. So this is IV fluid replacement pearls, and um, probably you know that better than me. Usually our plasma has 135 to 145 uh, sodium. That's the concentration, and the osmolarity is 291. If you give normal saline, it's 154 content of sodium, and LR, what we give here is 130. So you're giving double the amount the kidney is uh, getting rid of or dumping out. As we said, you promote hypervolemia, you increase or aggravate the hypervolemia, you aggravate the hypertension. So sometimes the patient comes out of the OR with a, a blood pressure 140, 150, a day later, they're 170, and you start just start giving um, medications, you start giving antihypertensive, and you totally ignore the fact that the patient is hypervolemic. And all they need is just correct the IV fluids, stop the IV fluids, or give Lasix. By the way, hypervolemia, again, leads to DGF and leads to coronary artery disease, AFib, and all these complications. Drift our attention towards post-transplant care. So this scenario really makes me cry post-kidney transplant. So for example, post-op day zero, a patient is 80 kgs. His blood pressure is 140 over 80. Post-op day one, you give them fluids, uh, double the amount of sodium, a CC by CC replacement, um, plus the 30 ml per hour. Patient slowly, weight goes up to 80 kgs. Blood pressure slowly goes up to 150 over 85. Slowly, weight increases to 84 kgs with a blood pressure 154 over 89. And here, instead of giving Lasix and stopping IV fluids and get rid of this fluid that's causing hypervolemia and intravascular volume overload, you start them on antihypertensive medicine. Once you start them on antihypertensive medicine, there is more room, the blood pressure drops, so you give more fluids, so the patient uh, gains more 3 kgs, so they end up with 87 kgs um, with a blood pressure of 151 over 87, and they're positive 7 liters. Guess what? You discharge them at 90 kgs body weight, the blood pressure of 162 over 92, positive 10 liters. Your output start to decrease and the patient develop azotemia. And then comes to the clinic, you mark them or label them a DGF and ask transplant nephrology to analyze them. So what's the difference between azotemia and uremia? Anyone knows? Azotemia is a BUN, high BUN, okay? So high BUN in lab, there is no uremic manifestations, uh, no uremic encephalopathy, no uremic pericarditis, uh, nothing clinical-wise, that's considered azotemia. Uremia, you're adding the clinical, any, any clinical scenario, confusion, uh, flappy tremors, all this. So uh, honestly, when the patient is discharged like this, this is how I look, because I'm a consult service, so this is how I look, and I hear the kidney crying and screaming for help. Yeah. Exactly. So in this particular scenario, the kidney screams, don't suffocate me. Um, when you give IRI fluids, you increase the preload on the heart. And when you increase the preload on the heart, you increase the hypervolemia, increase the load on the heart. At the same time, you cause renal vein congestion. What's renal vein congestion? Blood is coming into the kidney, but not able to come out of the kidney. You suffocate the kidney or you clog the kidney, you increase the, day, the rate of DGF. And that's exactly, you know how the toilet gets clogged? That's exactly what happens, the toilet gets clogged. So you're clogging the kidney, and then you say the kidney is not working, and then you call for dialysis. And that's again, a missed um, diagnosis or type two error. Uh, if we discharge them on a really uvolemic status, we could avoid a lot, a lot, a lot of complications. 
And this is a summary of hemodynamic assessment post-kidney transplant. So the patient is oligorheic. If the patient is oligorheic, I do look at the CVP, blood pressure, edema, and BNP. If they're hypovolemic, you can give only 250 to 300 normal saline uh, challenge. Normal saline is, uh, is, is a good uh, IV fluid replacement to elevate the blood pressure. Um, however, if they're U or hypovolemic, you just look at the Foley catheter first. They're persistent oligoria, despite uh, both scenarios. You do an ultrasound with Doppler or renal scan, especially if the patient hemoglobin drops a little bit. If you find no flow in the kidney, you consider surgical exploration. If there is a good flow in the kidney, that might be a DGF scenario. So this is a very broad scheme that you uh, approach when uh, you find those scenarios. So let me ask you, why did I target uh, RNs here with this lecture? Do you guys get this email at 4 a.m. in the morning? I love it, by the way. I read it all the time because you guys are the safety heroes. Look here. She alerted the provider and advocated for the patient. You guys are the safety heroes. Providers love feedback. If you find something uh, that uh, sounds not appropriate, sounds incorrect, just alert the provider. And again, no hard feelings. We're working all uh, to the best interest of the patient, right? So finally, those who understand shall alert others, spread the knowledge, and do no harm. Thank you so much, and I welcome any questions. Yes. Hello. Oh. Yes, we hear you. Can somebody hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. Karim, phenomenal cartoon. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you didn't you didn't see from the beginning, Ro. I saw it from the beginning. It was so good. No, I can't take my eyes off the slides. No, seriously, good, great presentation. <laughs> hey, a, a quick thing. As we said, I, I we have had this conversation maybe a hundred times so far in the last few years, and uh, I totally agree with you. We need to um, tweak a lot of few things. Uh, interesting thing. One of the things about uh, the post-operative fluids. Okay, it's. Uh, I just wanted to give you the uh, the whole thing. How things have changed over a period of time. So, uh, when I was a fellow here ten years back, our regular fluid replacement was half normal saline. I think that's that was the right replacement because we used to give plus or minus um, bicarb depending on the bicarb with half normal. And if the sodium goes up, goes down also, we used to like add a little bit of bicarb to that, and then you will correct the sodium. Then apparently, like when I left as a fellow and came back, we had switched over to normal saline because somebody did not follow the sodium, somebody became hyponatremic, had some, uh, got, went to the ICU, there was a uh, root cause, something like that. I heard the rumor because I don't know, I was not here. So when I come back, it is down to normal saline. Normal saline is the worst of all three, as you know, because highest amount of sodium, most acidotic fluid. Then we switched to LR because the institution has been pushing to uh, make LR as a replacement fluid as opposed to normal saline because there are a couple of papers which came out, not in transplant patients. This was most of them are ER patients and ICU patients. Study was done in Vanderbilt. They compared normal saline to uh, Ringer lactate. So I personally think for our patients, these are all, and not just personally, scientifically too, wrong fluid. Half normal with the ample of bicarb is like the perfect fluid. That's what we used to do in uh, when I was in Pittsburgh. That's what the fluid was. I mean, they used to even manufacture the right kind of fluid where 5% uh, dextrose with bicarb with uh, something and basically try to make it as so-called physiologic as possible. So issue here is hey, I'm totally I think one should be doing that too. But one of the these are the things I want to discuss in uh, the retreat. If we can have like a couple of slides regarding the fluids with the couple of awesome cartoons which will have the message. Because oh, issue is hey what is the difficulty for pharmacy to getting this fluid? Can we do this for all the patients? All those things. That's because we can have a slightly 
more uh, robust discussion with a bigger audience for that. Thanks, Ro. I, I totally agree with you that there are a couple of papers coming back that they say that the normal statin actually might cause AKI or, or delay the yeah. recovery of AKI, but this is native kidney number one, and this Correct. is not DGF uh, ATN kidney. It could Correct. be like a GN kidney post uh, post contrast. By the way, pre and post contrast data previously they used to give normal saline. Uh, I prefer half normal plus 75 because bicarb again. I think bicarb is great for the kidney. Bi yeah. Uh, the kidney loves the bicarb, honestly, loves. And there are tons of, of articles that they say bicarb per se in chronic kidney disease uh, delays the progression of kidney failure. I mean, uh, and if you follow that, but I, I totally agree with you, but for this type of thing, and, and you know that, and you agree, the, this type of DGF, all the guidelines have normal, plus or minus, and replete. And even if they develop hyponatremia, that's why the nephrologist is on board. I mean, uh, dump the trash on him you know yeah no and, <laughs> no so the problem previously was people just did half normal i mean by car uh, i mean obviously uh, the, see I, I was not here when the, we changed from half normal to normal yeah. uh, that was in those f three years uh, when it changed i'm sure it happened because nobody was following uh, this patient enough to change the fluid when the sodium started dropping to Say 129. Nobody looked at it at 129, and before you know it, it is 120, something like that. So it is not the fluid which is a problem. It is people did not follow up. Simple as that. And people were pounding the patient with fluids, basically and free water. The huge problem is they always say Lasix and salt do not work. So you're just don't drink and drive. You know, if yeah. you get Lasix on for someone who's like on high, high salt intake you're practically giving nothing. It's like giving EPO or erythropoietin with a low iron. So yeah. you're you're stimulating the bone marrow to form uh, like more blood and you don't have the supply to form the blood. I mean, stimulate to form cars and you don't have methyl or iron or whatever. So it's the same thing. If you give, I think if you give Lasix with a high normal saline, the blood pressure still remains elevated and you might not get the maximum benefit of it. Um, but yeah, you're right. So these are a couple of thoughts I just had from uh, like observation, and I talked. We talked together several times bro, about this. Like we had yeah. tons of discussion. Yeah. Yeah. No. Love this. Love this. And I love the last uh, twitching tail of the kidney. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Christy had a question. Thanks, man. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks, bro. Thanks. Thanks for coming. <laughs> so, uh, so what what do we do now? So now it's forty-eight hours. It should be twenty-four hours. Number one, it should be twenty-four hours. And actually, so to be honest with you, it should be it should be depending on creatinine trend. Okay, but twenty-four hours is great. And usually, what I do, uh, twenty-four hours to thirty-six maximum, and then I drop all of a sudden to seventy-five. Why? Because if you still if the kidney is making five liters per day. OK, assuming living kidney donor making like 10 liters per day, five liters per day, and you give 100 cc per c, uh, like a cc per cc for 48 hours, you delay actually the, the, the recovery of the kidney, the ATN recovery. So if you replace for 24 hours only and then drop PO plus, I mean, whenever they start PO, PO plus IV to 75 together, as long as the blood pressure does not drop, is hypovolemic, as long as that, that like put under this like 100 lines, the blood pressure is good. Uh, I'm with 75 PO plus IV together, 75. You have to wean the kidney quickly and make the kidney work. So 24 hours CC by CC. Why some living kidney donors can make up to 20 liters per day, okay? And if you do 75, they will run into hypovolemia real quick. And that's why, that's why some people give the 30 cc insensible loss. I don't think there is 30 cc insensible loss at all in our, uh, it, it just does not happen, but they give it to be on the safe side. And that's why the patient, some guidelines say, if the patient is making more than 15 liters per urine, there's sometimes safety there, uh, uh, 
safety their back and give another 200 extra, 200 extra, because they fear. I saw one patient before, like 10 years ago or something. He was a transplant patient post-op day one. He was making like 10 liters per day. The nurse is checking the CVP, and CVP was like 10 consistently. And then the patient tanked. Um, blood pressure drops. CVP is 10, and the patient died. Post-op day one or two. Why? CVP was obstructed, or just the neck is like... And he was like measuring as a, as a 10. What's the first sign to appear in patient who's losing fluid or is hypovolemic or intravascular volume depleted? What's the first sign? Make it easier. Tachycardia and then... Hypovolemic, so shock. He's, he's, he's going into shock. Tachycardia is right, totally right. Number two. Hypotension? Postural hypotension. So blood pressure is maintained, but when they stand up, they develop orthostatic hypotension. That's the second sign. Third sign is frank hypotension. Hemoglobin, by the way, takes some time to drop. So if he's seven and he's bleeding, if you follow in an hour or two, it might be still seven or 6.9, but it drops then all of a sudden after a while. So tachycardia is very important. Exactly volume, by the way. So sometimes you, you round on the ICU and you listen to the patient at the basis and you say chest is clear. 12 hours later, they develop frank pulmonary edema or sometimes we, we go, I mean, in the ICU, the patient looks not hypervolemic just to give him some bolus and he developed frank pulmonary edema. Because the lungs, when they accommodate fluid at the beginning, they accommodate in the basis and you hear these crackles or crepitations, you have to hear them at the end of inspiration. Because if you hear them just normally like this, you will not hear anything. So you tell them, take a deep breath. So at the end of the deep breath, you like crackles at the end. That means he's starting to develop impeding pulmonary edema or pulmonary congestion. That's why they stress on this a lot. Uh, all the board questions, everything, they stress on this a lot. If you find a patient by exam a little bit of clinically overloaded, what would you do? Do a BNP chest x-ray or do nothing? It's do nothing because it's a clinical diagnosis. Why should you do workup, further workup and spend more? And you might actually miss a diagnosis. If it's a very early pulmonary edema, you might miss it. And 12 hours later, they might run into pulmonary edema, actually. The main things, again, fluid is very important. The other thing is also I see a lot is the albumin part. Um, Albumin part. Albumin, again, put that in mind. If you look at the 8 FK level, this is not the level that causes uh, the toxicity. It's the free portion which is carried on albumin. If you have albumin low, you have a higher free portion, vasoconstriction on the kidney, and tremors. The other thing is, and this is the art of transplant, We, not every patient should be on FK 10 during the first six months. I mean, I don't want to play into protocols and stuff like that, but uh, the, the thing is, if you have someone living related donor and I mean, a great match, no DSAs before or negative cross match, everything, and, um, and very low risk of rejection, it's acceptable to keep it on a little bit of FKY. Uh, apart from FK causing vasoconstriction during the day. So if you check a creatinine in the morning, it could be six with a level of seven or eight. And if you check the creatinine at noon or afternoon, you might find the creatinine of 1.3 actually, uh, but we don't do that. So if you measure that hand in hand, because it's vasoconstriction and goes with FK, I mean hand in hand. So it causes vasoconstriction, intermittent AKIs that's unnoticeable. Number two, FK on the long run causes something called uh, fibrosis in the kidney. It increases the TGF beta, like uh, something that causes fibrosis in the kidney. So on the long run, it causes chronicity. So why, why FK? Because it's a backbone. I mean, it's a very important, extremely important immunosuppressant, very important. But, but extremely important immunosuppression. And there are a couple of, I mean, lots of papers and evidence if you have FK, fibrosis damages the kidney less than rejection. Rejection kills the kidney in a second, exactly like BK. If you have BK or rejection, treat rejection, don't care about the BK now. Rejection kills the kidney in a very short time. But the thing is, 
you got to be cautious when you play with immunosuppression. Uh, really cautious. Um, rejection is possible, yes. Uh, AKIs are possible, yes. But we walk on eggshells. It's an art. Um, and that's why we try to develop protocol, but you can never protocolize everything. Never. Any questions? Questions? <laughs> So it's very, to be to to be honest with you, it's 24 hours, okay, and then drop to 70. Once they take PO, just leave them if the blood pressure is great. Leave them and they. I think I think I, uh, when I talked to Bro, it was uh, mainly because it's, we used to give CC by CC and ex extra 30 and no matter what, and then flat rate them and then they go up with 10 kgs up. Even now, I mean, if you give LR or normal saline, they will go up no matter what, even if you give Lasix. I like a month ago, I came on service, a patient blood pressure consistently 200 over 100. They, he's on four blood pressure, she's on four blood pressure medication consistently 200 over 100. We're replacing with LR, uh, uh, stopping everything consistently. You cannot treat resistant hypertension without a diuretic. As if you were like a baby pushing a gorilla. You cannot. Uh, part of definition of resistant hypertension, it's resistant with three or more blood pressure medication, including a diuretic. Diuretic is very important. So get rid of the diuretic, give normal fluids, and look at the outcomes. Left heart cath, who needs a heart, left heart cath? There is no guideline that says anybody needs a heart cath, honestly. Uh, they say anybody walking in the street, if they have four met, more than four mets, function capacity is good, just do the transplant. It should be a very mild to moderate risk of, uh, of uh, operation. It's not a big risk. You just put a kidney, I mean, while I'm talking to her, it's like an appendix, removing an appendix. Um, <laughs> we, we're focusing on one thing and that's right i mean it, there's no problem but i'm telling you if someone had a cath right before transplant six months before transplant and they had a 40 percent obstruction and we're giving them this amount of fluid if you give me this amount of fluid i could collapse by the way <laughs> i mean everybody i mean you're it's a balloon okay and you fill this balloon with fluids, 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 fluids. It might rupture. I mean, and then when you fill all this fluids, you will develop ischemia. So the 40% will go up to 80%, 90% and then blockage. Okay. And then when you do a, an autopsy, you find a blockage of 90% of 100%. Oh, that patient should need a heart cath before. We missed the heart, left heart cath before. If you did the left heart cath before, it may weigh, show like a 40%. Uh, again, a left heart cath has problems. You damage the residual kidney functions. I always tell patients, do you make urine? Uh, some of you might, might have seen this. I sometimes like to do like a CT with contrast for patients who are really resistant hypertension and or whatever to rule back any, anything. Sometimes you want to do the contrast, okay? I ask the patient, do you still make urine? Uh, I've been on dialysis for a year and I still make urine and I have a residual kidney functions. I'm very skeptical of giving them a contrast because it's the kidney has two functions, getting rid of the fluids, which is very important and it will help post transplant uh, and uh, getting rid of the toxins. That might be the compromise. What are we doing? What might improve? Changing the fluids, keep them euvolemic, assess the volume status right and correctly. Uh, you cannot have a patient coming in with a blood pressure 150, you assume they're uvolemic because there is no edema and you give them the OR four liter positive, they come out of the OR with a four liter positive and then replete them with 130%, 130% or whatever, or one CC by CC and extra 30, avoid Lasix, blood pressure goes up, you give blood, you give antihypertensive, devices dilate, and then the patient comes in 10, 10 kgs. 
believe it or not, a young age can accommodate in their vessel up to five liters. So it will expand. I mean, the arteries are still expansible, but in old age, they won't tolerate. They would develop easy MI or AFib with RBR. Uh, easy, easy. Uh, honestly, I've seen patients with a heart, like so and so heart, uh, 79 year old, and they got transplanted and totally fine. It needs, I mean, it needs really very cautious follow up, very cautious loads, but they pass well. And they did not have had a left heart cath before. It's fine. I'm not saying left heart cath is, is, is bad or something. Uh, the protocols are fine, but there's no guidelines to it.